Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 721 of the podcast and it is Saturday the 28th of October 2023 as I record this. In today's show I'm talking to Tracy Cooper Posey about how writing memoir helped her reboot her fiction and her writing routine after medical treatment, how it's time to stop the madness in terms of the indie author industry, why you need to pick your direction and then take steps towards that instead of trying to do everything, which books age and which are worth revitalising in your backlist, dealing with discouragement, surviving hard times and using an author platform and email list for marketing rather than paid ads. So yes, lots to cover in today's show and that's coming up in the interview section. In Publishing and Book Marketing Things, Jane Friedman breaks down the latest Authors Guild survey results in her hot sheet newsletter. One of the interesting findings, when self-pub authors start out, they tend to earn exceptionally little compared to those getting traditional deals or advances, which makes sense. But if the self-published author keeps going and becomes established, if they can hit the five-year mark as far as this survey, they are likely to out-earn their traditional counterparts. So there was lots in this breakdown, but I thought this was really quite true, and so I wanted to mention it. And because the business model is so different between traditional and indie, and that often stops a lot of um traditionally published authors from going indie because they can't really understand how the business model works. But this is it. And I mean, talk about it with Tracy today, and we often talk about it. But um, when the if the author keeps going, if you keep writing books, if you keep reaching readers, building an email list, at about five years, you've got what is a much more sustainable income and a much bigger income. So, well, in and obviously not every time, but uh, as this survey says, they are likely to out-earn their traditional counterparts. And certainly I have seen this play out in my career. Uh, people who I was jealous of <laughs> in the first few years of publishing have mostly disappeared from the industry or come to me asking questions about how to go indie with at least some of their work in terms of traditionally published authors. So yeah, you have to be willing to build connections with readers, learn new skills, other than just the writing craft. And many authors are resistant to that. So yeah, I thought that was really interesting. And uh, Jane's hot sheet is is always full of, of good stuff. Links in the show notes. In book marketing, Written Word Media continues to expand their book promotion stacks, now including e-reader news today. Promo stacks automatically assemble and schedule pre-made single-day and multi-day marketing promotions. This provides authors and publishers with a comprehensive marketing solution, ensuring maximum visibility for their books, increased sales or downloads, and valuable time savings in scheduling. So yes, I actually have a promo stack tomorrow as I record this, uh, and I do these kinds of promotions for my backlist across all retailers. And of course, Ricky Wolman was on the show a few months ago talking about this kind of promo stacking. So uh, yeah, definitely still a good thing to do. So in AI and futurist things, I wanted to comment on the new Amazon robot, which is being reported across various things. The BBC, uh, which I'll link to in the show notes, has, has a video and other media report on Amazon's new Digit robot, which frees up staff. And it's definitely worth watching the video as basically this robot, which I think has kind of legs like a grasshopper, kind of they bend backwards and goes up and down. And essentially the robot picks up a box, turns around, puts it down again. (laughs) And I have a friend who worked in an Amazon warehouse and he said he only worked there a couple of weeks because he just couldn't stand it. It was so boring that 
uh, and repetitive because you just had to pick up things and put them, uh, turn around and put them somewhere else, which is what those robots are doing. And this has been Amazon's problem in their warehouses is that the staff turnover is so high. Uh, so the robots do make sense. And they say um, that it frees up staff and doesn't replace human jobs. And the reason it doesn't replace human jobs is because lots of humans don't want to do that job. But it's, I wanted to make a broader point about watching it do a task. And this is why you should watch the video, because this is what we need to think about with the AIs that are more digital. What the text AIs and the image AIs do. Pick a task, one task, and see if you can find an AI tool to make it easier for you. And that's how we work with AI tools. It's not like, oh, it just replaces my whole job. No, it doesn't do that because, you know, the impetus and the ideas and the emotion and the human aspect and everything that is you drives these machines. Uh, And in fact, these robots in the warehouse, they're picking and packing things for humans. (laughs) humans. <laughs> They're not shipping things to other robots at the moment, at least. But yes, they, they replace a discrete task. So that's how it's good to think about the AI tools. And still on Amazon, VentureBeat reports this week, Amazon debuted a new generative AI feature that allows vendors to upload photos of their products to the Amazon ad console and then add AI generated backgrounds. So a lot of us do this right now with our books. You know, we upload a book cover and then we use tools like BookBrush or Mockup Shots or Canva and it we'll put it on a background and then we use those in our ads, we use those on our websites and what basically this will be built into the ad tool, although it is currently in beta and who knows when we'll get it, but it's on its way for sure. Because the, And they have some stats that essentially purchases go up when things are in a lifestyle setting <laughs> rather than just like a photo of a kettle. If you put it in a nice kitchen, it's more likely to sell, even if that kitchen is AI generated. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. More and more AI tools from Amazon. And also on AI images, stock photo site Shutterstock will now let you transform real photos using AI and they'll make sure the original creators are paid. Uh, So you can craft picture perfect content with a palette of creative AI features to design and edit any Shutterstock image generated or stock photo. So I think this is interesting because, again, a lot of book cover designers use Shutterstock. um, And so anyone who has an issue with AI images you now can, I guess, if you're not using AI images as part of book cover design, it seems crazy now because Adobe Photo, Adobe Photoshop, which has Firefly and now Shutterstock, these images are licensed there. Uh, you can use AI and there's just no issue with it. So yeah, if you're still anti <laughs> AI images for part of your book cover design or your ad design, you don't have to worry about any of the rights issues with these tools. Right, so in other AI things, in my Patreon community this week, Jason Hamilton from The Nerdy Novelist, uh, which has a great YouTube channel, did a demo on how to use Claude AI to write a short story with a super prompt, which was very cool. And I'm starting to do videos like this within my um, Patreon community, patreon.com forward slash the creative pen. And yeah, so that was really interesting. I love seeing how other people use AI differently to to me. And that's another point about it being a tool. We don't, doesn't just replace you as a human. It's just a tool as part of your creative process. So in personal news, my Kickstarter for writing The Shadow has finished. Thank you so much to everyone who backed the campaign. The campaign made £36,454, which is around US dollars And of course, a big chunk of that is for printing books and shipping books, but it's still the best launch I've ever had. And I'm excited to be getting the book out as soon as possible. So I'm following up with Erid Payments and getting the surveys done. So uh, if you back the campaign, please check your Kickstarter account for any messages. If you're not getting any from me through your email, sometimes things fail to go through. Uh, So yes, please check your Kickstarter account to make sure that payment is done and that you do your survey, even for digital products, uh, because I need to do the tax and I need to send you this week. I'll be sending out the ebook and the audiobook and the um, PDF workbook and all the extras. So yes, I'm just 
finishing up on the audiobook editing and mastering and the digital files will go out this week. I'm also doing the print order to Book Vault for all of the books, including the gold foil hardbacks, which I'm just I'm just very excited about fulfilling this and getting the books to you. I will be going up to Peterborough, which is where the Book Vault printing plant is, and signing books on the 17th of November. That's the plan at the moment. And it will be twice as many as Pilgrimage. There's like 450 books to sign. <laughs> So luckily my signature is quite small. <laughs> so I'll be signing that on the title page and I'll definitely need to rest my arm after that. So yes, again, thank you so much. If you missed the campaign and or if you're listening, obviously, in the future, uh, Writing the Shadow is well, it's available on pre-order right now on my store and other stores for the 22nd of December. So you can get it on my store, 1st of December, other stores, 22nd of December, and it will be available everywhere in all forms formats from January 2024. The link will redirect. So if you go to thecreativepen.com forward slash shadow book, that will redirect to wherever you can find it. So thanks for all your emails and comments this week. What I'm actually loving with the, let's call it the slow demise of some social media, is that more people are leaving comments on the blog itself, which I really like. So thank you so much for that. Thanks to Amy, who sent a picture of pilgrimage in the new items section at her library. What a delightful surprise to see your wonderful pilgrimage memoir in the new items section of our library in Wisconsin, USA. Thank you for all you do. Thank you, Amy. I love to see pictures of my books in the wild, which is awesome. And on Pat McLean's episode about stop trying to do everything, at Ravens That Fly With The Night uh, said, I needed this today thank you. And uh, Jim said on Pat's interview, both enlightening and frightening at the same time for a first time author. And I just want to comment on that because yes, when you listen to Pat and also Tracy today, it's similar, hundreds of books. uh, It is. And I remember when I started out, it's like, seriously, these people are so far ahead of me. How am I ever going to reach that level? And it is just consistency over time. And as I mentioned earlier with that study, if you do this for for years, it does compound your your backlist compounds, your skill compounds, your income compounds, if you use it in the right way, obviously. Uh, so yeah, I think you can definitely get to a level of having a lot of books. But also remember, a lot of books doesn't necessarily equal the income. I use multiple streams of income approach rather than the hundreds of books approach Um So yes, I want the podcast to be useful for you wherever you are on the journey. And finally, Jane Steen says, Pat, you're such an inspiration. I was nodding a lot at this conversation, especially as I've had some of the same issues with falling income, increased expenses, and can see the day will come when I just cut back to writing, doing basic promotions and selling direct. I still want to write and connect with readers and I can definitely do those things in a slimmed down format. It will take courage to step away from some of the marketing and watch my sales find a new lower level, but the trade-off will be less work and greater focus on the things I love about this business. Thanks, Jane. And again, I think coming back to Kickstarter, I was talking to a friend yesterday and I said, I just feel so relieved. Like relief is a really big feeling at the moment for moving into my next phase of my career with Kickstarter and with Shopify and then also with all the other vendors but that my focus can be on direct sales and I can do my promotions and all of the business in a slightly different way, but still have, um, yeah, and just have that greater focus on the things we love, as you said. So yes, things are changing. More on that to come as we move towards the end of the year. So remember, you can leave a comment on the podcast show notes at thecreativepen.com or on the YouTube channel, or you can email me, send me pictures of where you're listening, or if you see my books in the wild, joanna at thecreativepen.com. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So this episode is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. KWL was built by authors for authors and their team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help you reach new readers around the world. Kobo's author first approach is why they built a promotions tool for you to easily and affordably market your book directly to Kobo readers. There are lots of promotional opportunities for you to keep an eye out for, from daily deals, percent off promotions and buy more, save more sales. 
you'll be sure to find something that suits your books and marketing plans. The promotional offerings are updated often, so make sure you regularly take a look to see what's on offer. And if you're taking part in a promotion, be sure to tell your readers about it. If you're a KWL author and don't yet have access to the promotions tool, email the team at writinglife at kobo.com and they'll enable this for you. If you want to learn more about KWL, check out the Kobo Writing Life podcast, available wherever you're listening to this, or find them on social. You can create your free account today at kobo.com forward slash writing life. And in fact, this reminded me when I was preparing the show to go in and apply for some more promotions, which I just did. So I'm in a spooky stories promotion, a 25% off box set promotion. I've applied for a Black Friday promotion, a free first in series deal and a Kobo Plus feature. So hopefully that will encourage you. Basically, I just apply for everything I can every few weeks. So I go in every three weeks, I apply for all the things and many get declined, but I also get a lot of promotions just by being consistent in applying. This is so much part of the career. You have to be consistent. And with Kobo, these promotions make a huge difference. So just because I focus on selling direct first, I still absolutely value Kobo and the other retailers. I make multiple streams of income of which Kobo is one of them. And I still do marketing on other platforms. So yeah, go get the Kobo promos. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing, but my time in creating the show is sponsored by my patrons. And as I mentioned, I'm in the process of kind of pivoting from just a podcast sponsorship thing to more of a community at patreon.com forward slash the creative pen. This week, as I mentioned, we did the first video chat and demo on Claude AI uh, to write fiction with Jason Hamilton from The Nerdy Novelist. I have a mid-journey demo. I have my own Claude demo uh, behind the scenes of my Shopify store, and I'm going to be doing much more. It also still includes the patron-only Q&A audio, as well as extra articles, discounts, and more. Plus, if you're at 20 Books Vegas, come along to the patron-only meetup uh, details in the Patreon area. So it's basically a monthly subscription of a black coffee or two a month. So if you get enough benefit from the show to buy me a coffee or two (laughs) and you'd like to be in the community, head on over to patreon.com forward slash the creative pen. So thanks to everyone who've been supporting the show for months and years. You're amazing. And thanks to new and returning patrons this week, Eva, Tom, Eddie, D.E., Christine, Tarjay, Stephanie, Richard, Varjo, Nathan, Ashley and Joe. So yeah, thanks to everyone. And I'm fully intending to sort of make this a much more useful thing uh, over time. Right, let's get into the interview. Tracy Cooper Posey is the multi-award winning author of over 200 romance novels. And today we're talking about her first non-fiction book for authors, The Productive Indie Fiction Writer, Strategies for Writing More, Earning More and Living Well. So welcome to the show, Tracy. Thanks, Joanna. It's absolutely fabulous to be here. Oh, it is. And of course, you and I met years ago now in in Oregon. Oregon, yes. Yeah, yeah. I I don't (laughs) know what year it was. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I've forgotten too, I think 2017 or something like that. Yeah, something sure. like that. Yeah, so we've known each other a while. But first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing and publishing. <laughs> well, I, honestly, the first thing I wrote was I wrote the unofficial sequel to Star Wars when I was in high school in the late 1970s. And my English teacher read it. Oh, she found it. <laughs> told me to write something original, so I did. And I kept on scribbling after that, but I hid it from everyone because, well, I came from a working-class Australian family who thought the reliable job after high school should be the sum total of my ambitions. So I was basically in my mid-30s and a single mum before I took writing seriously and started aiming for publication. And then I sold my first two books in one week in 1999. And after that, I was, because traditional publishing was the only option back then, so I had 35 books traditionally published. And it's such a soul-destroying industry. I ended up angry and frustrated most of the time. 
So I switched to indie publishing in 2011. It was like, thank God, there is an alternative. Now I have more than 200 titles under three different pen names, spanning romance, science fiction, fantasy, historical suspense, and a lot of stuff in between. And now, of course, nonfiction, the productive indie fiction book, and most recently, I've done a memoir. Ah, wait, I didn't know about the memoir. Well, I just have to ask about that because we'll we'll come back to the other stuff because you've had some health issues the last year or Mm, so. Yes. And Um, obviously, sometimes this is when we do write this kind of work. So what is that memoir about? Well, obviously, yes, it's a cancer memoir because I've been dealing with cancer. It's called Cancer Curated. And it literally came about because... I have readers that were looking for my next book when I was dealing with the cancer. So we ended up updating people in public on Facebook and stuff like that, letting readers know about what my health status was all the way through the cancer treatments and stuff like that. But there was a lot of stuff that didn't hit the the public announcements, the public updates. So basically the book is everything that happened up to the first of the public updates and everything that happened in between. So it's really a story of my journey through the cancer and exactly what I thought about it and (laughs) exactly what I thought about the consequences of the cancer, which in some ways are very unexpected. It's especially like getting older, you sort of age overnight with cancer, which for some people, including me because of my huge vanity, is a Mm -hmm. bit of an issue. So (laughs) So yes, it was the book that I sort of wanted to write because it filled in all the gaps. And I was getting a lot of feedback from people with the public updates saying, oh, your posts helped. And I thought, well, if the posts help, then maybe the book will help too. So I sat down and wrote it very quickly. It came, I think it needed to be written. It just emerged. (laughs) Well, that's really interesting. So like you said there, people found your public posts useful because a lot of people either themselves have cancer, their family has cancer, or other health issues that impact them. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is just the reality of life. Just personally, as a writer, because you've done 99.9% of your writing is fiction, and now you've done a memoir Mm. and a nonfiction, um, do you feel like this kind of writing is helping you in a different way? Are are you finding that you are uh, becoming a different writer because you're writing different things? Well, yes, absolutely, because writing nonfiction is not just simply switching genres. It's a whole new thing. There's quite a learning curve to it and things that you don't have to worry about with fiction, making sure your sources are correct and things like that. So there's a bit of a curve there. And also writing the memoir, of course, was basically I was pulling back the curtain and saying, ta-da, here I am, this is me unclothed and vulnerable. So it's a completely different pace for writing, I think. And also writing the two nonfiction books helped me get back to writing fiction again, which I was having trouble with. So it's helped round me out as a writer, I think. How did it help you get back to fiction? Was it just that you kind of relearned to get back to the the page as such? Yes, it helped me relearn that daily habit of writing. And because I wasn't like pulling on, I have to write this story, I have to develop all the scenes and all that sort of stuff. It was using different muscles for writing. It was a lot easier to do that daily writing and get into it. And because the memoir just about wrote itself, it it did, I think I wrote it in about 10 days it really helped me get back into that daily habit and get me enthusiastic about writing once more, which I had lost for a while. So when is that out or is that out right now? It comes out at the end of the month, late October on our site on storiesrealpress.com. And then it will be released at all the other bookstores in January. Fantastic. Well, I'm fascinated by memoir now. Obviously, I've done this pilgrimage book this year. And also my writing The Shadow has a lot of memoir aspects. And I think what's interesting, so this cancer book you've done right now is a very immediate memoir of this kind of particular period of your life. So I would expect I'm going to predict that over the next (laughs) few years, you are going to end up writing another memoir, maybe 
more than one about different things because of course your experience is going to continue and your perspective is going to change and your writing business is going to change so I think this is so interesting that you've got so many hundreds of novels and suddenly you're you're moving into new things so I want to encourage people there because some people feel quite siloed I think and maybe like you said 1999 I mean you've got 20 plus years in fiction Mm. and now you've broken out which is that's fascinating to me well I always was writing non-fiction but it was all short stuff so blog posts and essays and articles and things like that but this is the first time I've actually done a memoir And yes, it's a very different change of pace and it's, I think you're right. I think there may be more of it in my future because it really does tap into a different side of your brain. Mm. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's come to the productive indie fiction writer because this is a really good nonfiction book. Again, you've got so much experience and this book is jam-packed full of tips and we can't even touch the surface (laughs) with this interview. (laughs) There's a few quotes I thought were brilliant. So you you open the book with, it's time to stop the madness, (laughs) which is great. So what (laughs) madness is that and why have things changed? Oh, goodness me. When I first got into indie publishing, you could write, publish the book and go back to writing while your book sold very well. It was a very new industry. You just had to put the book out there and it sold. Now, of course, it's a lot harder to achieve that sort of visibility. There's a lot more books out there demanding readers' attention. You have to work for your sales. I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily, but now we all have to figure out how to make the sales happen And how that happens is different for every author. So there's a lot of moving parts we have to cover. There's a lot of things we must do. There's a lot of things we should do. And some of the things we should do, we simply don't have time to do. So we stew in guilt and we worry because we're not godlike and omnipotent and can get it all done. And then on top of that, we have this global sea of advice out there about how to thrive as an indie author. And I mean, some of it's flat out wrong, some of it's out of date, and some of it is advice for traditionally published authors, but there's no signal out there that that information is for traditionally published authors. So newer indie authors get all confused about this thing that they're apparently supposed to be doing, which actually won't help them. And then there's advice that only works for certain genres, or it only works for the author who's giving the advice. And I mean, some of the content too is promotional content that's designed to sell authors on courses and coaching and books and even more stuff. We should say yeah. that's ironic because this is a book with advice and, <laughs> and I have lots yeah. of books of advice. <laughs> so we're adding to it. <laughs> yeah, it's, yes, we are. But I also think that the more voices out there talking about the same subjects, The way you talk about a subject may help people, whereas how someone else describes that subject may not click with them. So I think there is room for people to talk about it, even though there is a lot of stuff out there, Um, which is why eventually I took your advice and actually wrote a how-to book. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But unfortunately, I think a lot of the advice is presented to new indie authors as mandatory. You know, they must do this or they must do that or their business will fail. So you get scared and you're worried that you're going to miss something important. And so indie authors are sinking beneath this huge deluge of information and advice and services and resources that hit us from every angle every day I mean our social media feeds have got it advertisements are everywhere we go you get promotions in author groups I mean I get text message advertisements now I get adverts from my operating system I mean that's the madness that's the insanity making pressure we're under these days there's this huge overwhelming number of things we should be doing that we can't possibly fit into our days and a whole lot of advice and information telling us about even more things we're failing to do. And it's just, it's crazy making. No, it's, it's completely true. And it, it, it is difficult to sift through it all. So you've got a chapter on managing the tsunami of information, but how are you managing? Because also yes. with your health issues, if you only have a certain amount of energy, how do you decide what to do? And how can people listening decide what to do? 
I think the biggest step is to accept that you can't do everything. You can't read everything. You can't listen to every podcast out there. You can't know everything, not today and certainly not in the future because it's only going to get worse. So that requires, I think, you have to get rid of the fear of missing out on that one magic thing that's going to make all the difference. I mean, the one magic thing doesn't exist anyway. The experts that sell you on a course or a book about that one magic thing aren't lying, but the one magic thing they're selling worked for them. It might not and probably won't work for you. So, I mean, all authors and all indie businesses are unique. They work in different ways. They respond to different things. So you have to find your own one magic thing that works for you. So you don't have to worry about missing out on that key piece of information just because you can't consume all the information. And I think if you can get rid of that fear, then you can relax. Then you can relax. deal with the tsunami of information. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I co-wrote a book, The Relaxed yeah. Author, but I know relaxing <laughs> is a difficult thing. Just on that, you said find the one magic thing that works for you, but I don't think there is one magic thing. You kind of have to decide on what your strategy is and then pick your direction almost. And I th I don't think there is a single one magic thing either. It could, It's probably going to be a combination of things that are unique to you and your business. So you have to keep swapping things in and out and trying different things and if something works you continue doing it unfortunately in this industry it may not work forever <laughs> so mm. you'll be looking for something else later but it's you have to keep working your business and finding there is no one thing for anyone it's just finding the next little piece of information that might help you but I think worrying about if you're not consuming it all and missing out on something is a waste of time and energy. So let go of having to cover it all. Pick quality sources and then when you get that information, do something with it. If you're smart with your time, you'll get maximum value out of it, whereas someone trying to cram in as many books and blogs and po podcasts as possible might not be using that inf information as well as they could. And really, yeah, I, I think that's the key is prioritising. Mm. Yeah, and I think, I mean, obviously people listening to this are listening to us right now. But I think the important thing too is to find people to model who are doing what you want to do. So there's no point asking me about romance, for example. You have a lot more knowledge about that than me. There's no point in people really asking me about kids' books. I don't do that. I don't think you do that either. So no, you know, neither do I. No, exactly. Yeah. And so, and also finding people whose voice and whose attitude you resonate with, um, because there are lots of people with great information and experience who you just don't necessarily resonate with. So I think that's that's important mm. too. But let's come to some things that actually are or mainly work for most people so you do have in the book backlist is holy so tell us a bit more like why is that and how does the backlist underpin your author business well it's not just mine it underpins all indie author businesses it's just a fact of the way the indie industry is set up traditionally published authors rarely have older books available for sale they're focused on the current release and everything depends on them selling super well in the first 30 days and after that, the book is a memory. You can't find it in the bookstores. And bookstores won't give up shelf space to stock previous books either. So all the traditional author has is the next book, the next release. And even the traditionally published ebooks sink out of sight because the publisher doesn't promote them and they don't and they price them out of the market. Indie publishing, on the other hand, at the moment, is unique in the publishing world. It lets us keep our previously published books available for sale forever. Even better than that, we can review and update those backlist books whenever we need to. I mean, they can age like fine wine and they can get better as time goes on. Our backlist catalogue is where indie authors make their money in the long term. So if you've just released a book seven in a series and you're promoting it, a reader who's new to you as an author might be interested but they'll go back to book one of your series and start there. I can track whole sales, whole series sales, because I track my sales every day. 
and I can see a whole series get picked up by a reader. And usually they don't pick up book one. It'll be book two to book seven or however many are in the series because they've already read book one, they've got hooked, and they just buy the rest of the series. So an indie author's latest release will funnel readers into their backlist. And readers who like what they find will spend all their time and money in that backlist. So your backlist deserves time and attention. I mean, devotion, if you like. That's why it's holy. Yeah, and I think the customer value is so important. And there's so much focus on the sort of first book. or And it's hard if you're starting out and you only do have a couple of books. It's hard to see a decade ahead two decades ahead um to when you do have a lot of backlist but i did want to ask you on the challenge of this because you said you can review and update books but when do you update Mm. books and when do you just let them go or you (laughs) spend your whole life updating books yes i don't think people really understand how much of a time sink it can be until they've suddenly got 50, 60 books on their hands and realise that the older ones are looking very dusty. But basically, you have to get systematic about reviewing your backlist books regularly and keeping them updated. I mean, links go out of date, they break. I mean, links are like weeds. They just, they break without warning and suddenly you've got a broken link on your hand and you have to make your books look fresh and new so that readers who are digging into your backlist don't feel like they're picking up really old books because they're new to them. So if they look new and fresh, then that keeps the reader experience pleasant. But I don't think we should ever ever let books go either. I know that some authors consider retiring books, but for me, the way I see it, They're a potential source of income, even if they're only selling a copy a year. It doesn't cost anything to keep them available, so why wouldn't you? And I I base this on the fact that on how I deal with authors who are new to me. If I like a new author, I'll dive into their back catalogue and I'll read everything they have. And if I really like that author, I'll get obsessive and I'll start hunting down their shorter works too. Have you seen that the mega books that are out there? John Gregory Betancourt puts out a lot of mega books that are collections of stories that have been out of print for a while. He'll hunt down the estates of deceased authors and arrange with their heirs to republish the author's catalogue. He also collects a short fiction of still living authors that is now out of print and he republishes it. So, I mean, I love these because they're very cheap and you can pick up a lot of uh, really old great fiction. So when I'm obsessively collecting a new author, I can quite often find their older short fiction in one of the mega volumes. But this is the thing. I'm always disappointed if I can't find everything that author has ever written. Mm -hmm. I don't want to disappoint readers in the same way. So, I mean, I know of at least two readers of mine who've made it a project to collect everything I've ever written, and that's just two readers that I know oh, about. That's lovely. So there may be more out there. Anyway, so I will always republish anything of mine that's fallen out of print. When the rights are returned to me, I don't just leave it sitting around. Even the books and the stories I wrote before I was first published in 1999, I now use as magnets for readers who are new to me on tracycooperposy.com. So for me, I don't think you should retire books. I think you should do the complete opposite. But if you really think you should retire a book, then I think you need to make sure they're truly dead before you inter them. I mean, update the cover or re-edit the book, do a small re-release, make a fuss, do some promotion, see if you can move copies. And if you get the sales, it might be worth leaving the book up. If you can't make sales despite promotions, then maybe you can think about retiring it then. This is interesting because I would say this is because you've only written one nonfiction. Uh, because a nonfiction <laughs> ages really fast. And so there, what Okay, happens- yes, that is a very good point. I'm sort of thinking just fiction. So yes, you make a very good point. I think perhaps there are some nonfiction titles that could be retired or updated or something like that. And I think updating it may get to a point where you just don't want to do it anymore or the the industry has changed so much the book is not relevant anymore. So perhaps that is a very good argument for retiring a book. 
But as far as fiction is concerned, I can see no point. Yeah, and it's one of the benefits of fiction is that it doesn't age. But if you do have, let's say you have 10 series and, you know, you're like, okay, these covers, I mean, we can all look in a secondhand bookstore and see covers that really date books and it's oh, like yes. okay oh yes yeah, okay. <laughs> exactly and it's like well if you have to do that if you have to recover an entire series but maybe this is a tip for people is to you don't have to update everything all the time if you've got a new book coming out in a series or that is related somehow go through update those things that are related yes. you don't have to keep everything up to date all the time basically no, and I do recover series. I've just spent a lot of money recovering one of my most popular series. I look at the the covers, which were getting quite dated, and had a new release come out in the series. So I just went through it and recovered all of them and updated the interiors. That was a huge job. But now I shouldn't have to deal with that series except to update links that get broken and things like that for quite a few years. And you mm. sort of rotate through your, your series that way. Every now and again, you'll realize that, wow, that one's looking really old. Or you may have a book come out or it gets put in a promotion that's part of that series. There's usually a reason that prompts you into updating a series like that, especially doing a major recover and things like that. But generally, the updating just you is, is internal stuff, making sure the metadata is fresh and things like that. Well, you mentioned money there and you do have a chapter on nine high level hacks to preserve your indie revenue in hard times, which, of course, it's fantastic. Hard times come and go. They can be in the economy. They can be in your personal life. So maybe you could talk about that because money is a, a big deal for everyone. You just said you spent lots of money there on, on a, a rebrand, but also with your health issues, you weren't necessarily earning tons except from the backlist which is very good but give us some tips on the money side and you're right I've had a horrible couple of years as far as revenue is concerned I think most hard time thinking can be summed up as stash whatever you can and a lot of people only think of that in personal terms but it applies to your business as well I mean obviously you cut your expenses to the bone and you'd be surprised what you can live without, what you can do for yourself. And this is for both your business and your personal expenses, which the business is covering as well. So cut everything, cut. There's more than more there that you can cut than what you think when you really sit down and, and look at it. Obviously, you stash your cash. I think every business should have a savings account, especially creative businesses like indie writing. I mean, whole segments of the industry can implode without warning. It's very uncertain. It has cycles. It can it go out, goes up and down. I mean, this summer was really bad for indie sales for everyone because the pandemic was over and everyone was out doing anything but reading. So hard times can come and go and unexpected things can happen. So I think every creative business should have a savings account with as much in there as you can possibly get to cover those hard times and those unexpected things. The other thing you can do is you can stash your books. I mean, write lots of them, but keep your normal publishing schedule. And that gives you time to do things that you used to pay other people to do. In really hard times, people look for cheap distractions and entertainment and fiction fits that bill. So this is what I was saying. During the pandemic, I dropped prices on a few of my series so people without work could afford my books. And I watched readers buy their way through all my series as a result. And But then there was the expected depression didn't really happen. Economies are bouncing back as people head out and enjoy themselves once more. So we've all had this really bad summer. And I think... If you've got the reserves there already, you can live through those hard times. But above all, you have to keep writing and keep putting the books out there. Well, what about other revenue streams? So, for example, you mentioned your store selling direct. So by selling direct, you are going to be able to make more of the profit. You can also sell memoir and nonfiction for more than fiction. So these other revenue yes. streams that are book related are a good I idea, I guess. They are, but they can be 
very time consuming and they can be long term to, to put into effect. I happen to be good at getting books out pretty fast. So I got two nonfiction books out there just in a few months. But for writers who can't spend as much time as I can writing or are a bit slower at writing, um, adding in new revenue streams, which is always a good idea, I think. Uh, J. Michael Straczynski, actually, in his memoir, was talking about uh, the, the three-legged stool theory that all writers and all creatives should have three different forms of revenue coming in. And, I mean, this is J. Michael Straczynski, who's a wonderkind in Hollywood. You'd think he'd be fine just screenwriting, but no, he actually has two other forms of revenue coming in at all times too. So getting new revenue streams in there is always a good idea. It's diversifying. It means that you're not relying on the one form of income all the time. But as I was saying, it's sometimes it's a long-term process to get those th- different revenue streams into place. So when you hit hard times unexpectedly, it helps to have the stash there, stashing book stash or cash stash and, and things like that too. Mm. Well, that I think that's interesting. And you're right, you have to have a long term view on this. And you actually have to build for hard times before the hard times hit. So otherwise, it, as you say, it's not so quick. But I, what I think is amazing about the selling direct model is uh, plus an email list. So let's say you build your store and you have an email list and you can put a book up or you can do a bundle, right? I mean, you have so many possibilities for bundles. You send an email and because of when you sell direct, you can get money immediately. And that yes. I think is is magic. Like the money is in your account that day and that we haven't been able to have before. No, and I think this is one of the cool things about direct selling. There's so much flexibility in it. As you mentioned, the bundles are great. You don't you can put formal bundles out on the retailers, but if you're selling direct, you can bundle anything you want. And uh, one of the things we're actually thinking about coming up to Thanksgiving and Black Friday is doing really crazy things like we're going to create a bundle of every book I've ever written that's available Mm. for sale and put it out at a discount just for Thanksgiving. And for every other author that sells through Stories Rule Press, we'll do the same thing. But that's not something that you can do on the retail stores. And as you said, once, once you do that, the money is, well, it's technically you don't get it exactly that day depending on how your payment system set up. I go through Stripe, so I get it a few days later. But it's still far more immediate than it is waiting forty five days to get it get the money from the retailers. Mm. And the if other you have thing, PayPal, you it can happen immediately. Yes, basically. yes, it can happen immediately with PayPal, which is nice. And that's the other thing too: the email list is so so important. You've got to have that, and I think that's whether you're selling direct or not. But when you're selling direct, you can do cool things like mention a backlist book that may be a bit dusty that nobody really has looked at for a while. Talk about it a little bit, talk about how you wrote, why you wrote it and a little bit around. Readers really love that stuff. So if you spend a little time talking stories about the book itself, you can suddenly get a rush of sales for a few days, which is really nice. And again, that's not something you can do with the retail stores because you don't know who your customers are there. Yes, exactly. And, and But I do think this idea of building for hard times i like the stash stash the cash and stash the books and yes. let's say stash stash the email list <laughs> mm, yes yes stash the email list stash time i mean there's all different ways that you can stash things and if you're putting things aside for when the hard times hit you can ride out the, the terrible summer we just had and still thrive I know personally because I've had not only just the terrible summer everyone else has had, I haven't put any books out for a couple of years, except I had two books that I put out. So I've lost readers and my sales have tanked. And for me, because I had reserves there, I mean, basically my reserves are gone now, but I got through a terrible summer anyway because of those reserves. Yeah, and I mean, you've had uh, really hard times and you you do actually have a chapter Mm. on dealing with discouragement. So, of course, people, I think a lot of authors are probably discouraged with the industry, with how much 
people feel they have to pay for marketing, for um, the fact there are so many books available. And we're not going to talk in detail about AI, but I know a lot of authors are discouraged by yeah. the potential of a lot more content with AI creation. So there's a lot of reasons to get discouraged. So how, yes. what are your tips for dealing with discouragement? Well, I think there, there's two sort of different discouragements there and I think I, I, we should talk a little bit about the there's an ongoing career halting discouragement basically a depression if you're in that situation where you just you really cannot get out of your own way where your business is being impacted where you simply it's long long term I think then that is definitely a time where you need to get professional help you need to talk to someone find out other ways to, to help you get back to a more even keel but having said that, everyone can have a bad day or even more than one bad day. I've had a bad summer. I mean, anything can, can give you discouragement. You can have crappy reviews. You can have drooping sales. You can have an author snark at you in a group and that'll just, <laughs> that can ruin your day. Or, I mean, this is a, a really common one and I found I had this a lot when I was less established than I am now an author you thought that was at the same professional level as you goes supersonic overnight and wins awards and tv deals and hits bestseller status and that can depress you for a long mm. long time for all of these things I think the best antidote is to journal it out I mean self-awareness is marvelous it shrinks problems but writers often can only figure out what they're thinking when they see what they've written so in that case, writing things down and journaling and just trying to get at the source of your issues can help take all that pressure away and you can find your way back to being encouraged about your industry and your business. Um, another thing that I find often helps is to read my own books. Go back and read your backlist. It reminds you why you're writing and how actually how good you can be because depending on how long it's been since you read the book, you can read it and be surprised and think, wow, that's really just not quite as bad as I remember it being. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, I mean, that's encouraging too, and that can fire up your enthusiasm to get back to writing. And, of course, the, the ultimate antidote is to write another book or finish the one that you're currently on. I mean, getting lost in a story is really good medicine for just about everything. And the other mm. thing to remember too, I think, for a lot of authors, you have to remember, and I think you alluded to this earlier too, indie publishing is at a historic point and there's more authors able to support themselves and write full-time than at any other time in publishing history. So remind yourself that you're in a fantastic industry with great opportunities. Pay your bills at the end of the month and appreciate that you're able to do it and keep on writing. Yeah, and I mean, the, you're one of those people who has absolutely no problems writing tons of books. That is one of your superpowers is, is writing fast. Um, <laughs> but I think what's interesting is it isn't just the writing. I feel like sometimes we do say just write another book. But what I'm interested in, we talked about email marketing, but what else are you doing to market because of course having your own store I talk about, about that a lot at the moment but having your own store or having loads of books you still have to get traffic to those books so what do you feel mm. at this point 20 plus years on what are you doing for marketing now that is is working for you for me platform is is the big key I don't do pay-per-click advertising I find that that doesn't work anymore if you can't do it well, you can lose a lot of money very quickly doing it. So I tend to avoid the pay-per-click advertising. And instead, I work my platform so that readers can discover me. And one of the biggest tools for discovery I found is book funnel promos and book funnel sales. I go in a lot of those every month for all my pen names. And uh, that feeds readers into the sales funnel. They discover me, they get to read a free book if they want, and hopefully, usually, 
they like the book, so they buy the rest of the series, and suddenly they're a reader of mine. They join my email list, and once I have them on my email list, I can keep providing them with new ideas, new possibilities for them to read. So the combination of using Book Funnel to, for readers to discover me and the email list to keep their interest up and work their way through my backlist is the best thing that I've found working that works right now, whereas other things have kind of faded away and don't work as well anymore. Kickstarter was not good for us. I've tried Patreon, but I keep coming back to Book Funnel. It works. Mm, that is so great because I mean obviously I've had Damon on here talking about book funnel and I use them to deliver books from my store and things but I, mm. I don't really do their promo so great to hear that you do that I think that's quite different also will help and encourage people who maybe also don't have a budget like because you can get into these promotions anyway but I mean give people a, a tip on that though because I have had a look at some of them and it's quite mm. hard to know what ones you should be involved in so how do you judge what is a good promotion to be involved with it's well um you get to know the organizers the the people that are coordinating the promotion it seems to be the same people over and over again so you get to know which ones attract a lot of other authors which are good promotions to go in that's one thing but if you're brand new to book funnel you're not going to know that i think my guidelines tend to be if the promotion is longer than a month i won't go in it because that's tying your book up in a uh, possibly in a discount situation for quite a long time. So it's quite a commitment. So I tend to avoid the promotions that last longer than a month. I also tend to avoid the promotions that are very, very general. So if it's just romance, I won't go in it because it's not genre specific enough, particularly for romance readers who can get very, very narrow in what they will read. So the authors that are in it may be bringing, say, contemporary romance readers to the promotion while you've got a historical romance in that promotion, which all those contemporary romance readers are not interested in. So if it's a very general just romance or just science fiction or something like that, I tend to hesitate before I'll go into that promotion. I much prefer the promotions that get very, very specific. So that's a couple of tips, I think, that some quite big ones that will help new re- uh, new authors that are just going into book funnel promotions i know that's really helpful it's always good to learn what other people are doing and i think that's fantastic so we're out of time where can people find you and your books online i've got websites all over the place but headquarters is storiesrulepress.com you can find me and all my books there including some that aren't available anywhere else. There are also links there to your preferred retailer if you really don't want to buy books directly from me. And there's links to all my other sites, including the Productive Indie Fiction Writer. So that's storiesrulepress.com. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time, Tracy. That was great. Thank you. It's been fun. So I hope you found the interview with Tracy interesting and that it gave you an insight into the longer term business model and how to take steps towards your own direction in this business. So yeah, I really enjoyed that interview. Next week, I'm talking about Pinterest for book marketing with Trona Freeman. And you might think, what the? (laughs) Given that Pinterest is an older platform, but It's so much fun to use generative AI for images, uh, especially with the fiction side. We can create pictures of our worlds and our characters. And I and also Pinterest has a very tight integration with Shopify. So I am taking more of an interest in Pinterest for marketing in 2024. So we'll be talking about that in the next show. In the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.